Caddis Maximus here this time with the follow-up video, uh, Teardown. I've been doing these as separate videos just so that the review doesn't become uh, a ridiculously long video. So I'm just going to take this apart just so people know how to take it apart. And for anybody who's curious on uh, what it looks like inside, how they designed it, etc. Obviously, the first thing is we'll remove the battery, which sometimes is a little bit... There we go. The next thing that we have to do is there's a little clip right here that holds the two case halves together right here in the bottom. What I find is actually a hook pick works the best because what we want to do is we want to try to get under that while at the same time just prying up a little bit on it. You do want a flathead screwdriver so we kind of get it positioned under there as we get under here. Not too much tension. We just pry out the hook. Almost had it there. Sometimes this is just a little bit fidgety when you try to get this apart. What? Really want to make sure you get that hook all the way up, but without going too far and bending it. There we go, and all I have to do is just slide it up a little bit and then work it the rest of the way off. The next thing is we do have a sticker that's joining the two halves together up here at the top. So we'll just want to use a little razor blade and go ahead and split that sticker right down the little split line the case has. Just like so, and you really can't tell that you made any cut at all. And then the next thing is you'll want to remove all these screws. There appears to be seven T10 torque screws in there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, use this. Milwaukee electric screwdriver. Actually, maybe that's a bit too much. We'll go ahead and use a little hand driver here. Here we go. We got all seven of those out. They're all indeed the same length. I like to have a little bit of a rag to set any gears and stuff on just because uh, I don't want to get it uh, introduced particles or anything like that to it. And we'll just slowly work these two case halves apart. You kind of want to hold the gearbox. You always pull... very rarely is it the opposite of the way. I'm taking this apart on power tools, which is the side that you pull the screws out of, is generally the half that you want to try to work up first. And if like any gear boxes or gear cases like this want to stick to this half that you're pulling up, just kind of hold it against the uh, remaining half until you get it loosened and comes right apart. We can see indeed, even though there's just a small amount of metal protruding, it is an all metal throughout the inside. We can see it, it, the gearbox has this little lug right there, which the two case halves pinched together, So, it, as well as these big side lugs. So it really is uh, pretty well secured in there. I'm actually surprised that they made this portion so short and why they didn't bring the plastic body back a little bit. But I think it's just because of the overall length. And it is pretty darn tiny. This is just super duper short right here. Taking another quick look around here, there's just a, so many wires that go in and out of the trigger. Here's the control board. This is where Milwaukee has to play, place it, and it isn't uh, epoxied, although it is conformal coated, which means that there's basically a layer of lacquer over the whole board. Not quite as heavy duty as the upper switch. We can see where they actually put glue on the back of the switch and all of its circuits to give it extra protection. It is nice to see rubber sealed ball bearing. We can see an E-clip on there. So if the bearing needs to be replaced, it appears it's super simple. You just pop off the clip and then the bearing shouldn't be pressed. You should be able to actually just pull it off by hand and reinstall it, which is always a good thing. This little aluminum piece is the heat sink over the power transistor. See, it's right next to the wires that go directly to the motor. This circuit board and that little brass fitting. The circuit board has three Hall effect or magnetic sensors, and there's a little magnet uh, in that brass piece. And so as the motor spins around, it knows exactly what position it's in so it can activate the fields appropriately. This is known as a censored brushless motor. Um, there are uncensored ones. That's what drones use because drones don't, the motors don't run at low speeds. They don't need a lot of torque when they start up. They just start spinning fast and then govern themselves simply by the fact that it, the computer just speeds up or slows down the switching of the coils. But in power tools, you need a sensor because unfortunately when these brushless motors are driven, what is known as blindly, where it just starts rotating or cycling the field around, if the motor has a lot of load, it will just stall out and actually shimmy and shiver back and forth. And so you need sensors so I can say, oh, I'm having a hard time turning. I need to, you know, keep certain these fields on for a longer period of time until I can detect that the motors turn some and then I turn on the next set of fields. 
and I actually was learning about that recently. And so it's interesting that the drones just don't have censored brushless motors because they don't need the sensors. Even computer fans have sensors just because um, they need to tell if the computer fan is stalled or not. But they don't have three sensors for position. It's just a stall one sensor for stalling. Fortunately, this was actually pretty easy to pull out because it has such a small gear. And uh, we just pop it out like so. You may be wondering, well, if there's a ball bearing on the back, all I see is the motor, the fan, and then this little gear. And that little gear is actually riding, appears to be riding on a ball bearing inside there. Let's take a, a look-see. Oh, no. Actually, it's a good thing. Milwaukee, this is a threaded collar onto the back of this. Turns out I was wrong. It's not threaded. On uh, some Makitas, this is the back cap is actually threaded on, which maintains good alignment. This is actually not threaded. And the, one of the nice things about Milwaukee tools, even the, uh, to this day, is that they have excellent uh, service documentation, and they have documentation from more than a half a century of their tools. You can find old Milwaukee tools from the 60s and 70s and still be able to dig up documents. Yes, they actually scanned in all their old documents and made them available on the web. Uh, and they include proper service instructions, greasing instructions. On the more modern tools, they actually have full color photographs. It's showing exactly where the wires need to go. And uh, I noticed that there is a ground lug there for that gear case. I'm not sure why they have that on these cordless tools. Anyway, this back case is actually just held in by an O-ring. And so you just press up on the anvil. I'm not going to disassemble the anvil because those things are always just a, a real fussy to disassemble here. Anyway, what we can see here is we have a ball bearing in the steel outer case, and it is nice. It is steel. One thing you should take note, <laughs> I should say, take note of or notice of is the positioning of these three dog legs. And the upper dog leg faces the top of the gearbox, or the opposite of that lug there. So we have one what appears it is. It's a rubber sealed ball bearing which is supporting the whole uh, gear carriage but interestingly we have a ring machined in the gear carriage and on the inside of that carriage there's our second ball bearing. This ball bearing is actually what the end of the motor is riding on. When Milwaukee service or says to service these uh, they say to remove 90 95 percent of the grease. I didn't know that. And it's really super duper simple inside here. That's all there really is. There's the anvil. There's a Teflon uh, thrust bearing acting as a thrust bearing when you're, you know, pulling back. And uh, there's a little anvil. And then what just happens is that the anvil stops. These two teeth hit against the anvil. The motor continues to turn it. And as this rotates, it has two ball bearings and a special track. So this inner part is the most expensive because it has those special tracks. And it just rides up the tracks until it lifts and then it sp spins around and drops down at the same time and impacts the dog teeth. And either the fastener turns or turns a little bit uh, or doesn't turn at all. And it just repeats the process until it loads low enough to where it can't force it back up. Now, with if, when, if you're ever re-greasing an impact driver, only put a little bit of grease up in this front part. If you put too much grease, and it can prevent the hammer from fully dropping down hydraulically, but you can put more grease back in there. And I don't know about on this walkie, but on more or in corded or larger electric impact wrenches, uh, this spring here uh, will either have a, 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 you know, a ball or a needle thrust bearing on this side. Some manufacturers put it on the inside of the anvil, but better ones put it on the back. That way the mass of the spring itself also uh, goes along with the weight. I do want to mention, since Milwaukee makes uh, most of their tools really easy to at least take the case halves apart without disturbing the gearbox, the way the airflow works because of the driver board in its position, once again, it comes in just through these two holes on each side by the trigger. The molding here has this extra, if you can see it, there's all this extra flashing. That tucks in right here to make sure that the airflow can't bypass the motor. So the air comes in from the trigger and is forced across the board so it can cool uh, this heat sink. And then there's some of the extra power transistors you can see up there. There's a little processor. There's a connector with a whole bunch of wires because it has all the sensor wires and all the wires for this control board. So uh, that's a pretty big connector. 
anyway, so the airflow is kind of forced to go by the board and then back up through the motor to cool the windings and then back out through the vents. And so there's a lot of convolutions, a lot of areas for dust, especially sawdust. Uh, to build up and it's just really easy because all you have to do is pop a clip pop seven little screws and then just hit it with the air I mean you can have it uh, taken apart and put back together in you know three minutes Anyway, that's a little tear down. I'll show you save you the bore of actually uh, Putting it all back together and I guess the thing that we're learning about what Milwaukee has done is uh, in order to try to shrink it down even more is the fact that they've integrated the front ball bearing of the motor into the actual inside of the hammer assembly and that saves them like a quarter inch or five sixteenths of an inch or something in length anyway uh, I should also mention that this handle is of course fiberglass 30 percent reinforced nylon which is really good but you know tools of yesteryear were fiberglass reinforced polycarbonate but the nylon really does hold up and it is a bit cheaper and it's just a little bit more compliant. Polycarbonate is extremely heavy duty, but when it breaks, it tends just to break completely off. Where nylon's a little more forgiving and with the fiberglass, it'll crack and you can still kind of keep it together until you get new parts. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Until next time, Caddis Maximus out.